Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly. The films are Burning, Dead Souls, and On the Basis of Sex, or the new book, Burning Dead Souls on the Basis of Sex. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi, Jill. I know you love to make sentences, even little novellas, out of our titles. And this week, I guess I handed you some good ones. For this that this was what are they, what do they call it? This was a, a a meatball right over the center of the plate, to use a sports metaphor. And it is also a, a, a novella. I'm not sure I want to read. Yeah, but. likewise. But it's <laughs> it, it's it's perfect for current events. Anyway, it, it, it certainly is. However, what we have here in actuality uh, are three very different movies, and a couple of them are not exactly playing at every multiplex, but they're worth seeking out because they're very, very interesting films. And then our third one, which I'll get to in a few moments uh, on the basis of sex, uh, that's sort of that is playing in every multiplex uh, and is kind of an interesting movie as well. But let us begin with Burning. Uh, Burning is a South Korean film. Uh, South Korea has a, a very active uh, film industry. Industry and a lot of very gifted filmmakers, and one of the more gifted uh, is uh, Lee Changdong, uh, who's made a couple of movies which have really had quite uh, illustrious showings uh, playing in art theaters uh, in the United States. There was one called Poetry, another one called Secret Sunshine, which are probably uh, Lee Changdong's best known movies. Uh, Burning uh, is a kind of a bold film because, for one reason, it's uh, about two and a half hours long. So uh, not a movie for everybody to just sort of run out and see on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, and uh, the story alludes to a very famous story of that title by William Faulkner. And in fact, one of the main characters of the movie Burning is actually reading the collected stories of William Faulkner. So we have here a South Korean film, uh, which uh, has this kind of indirect reference in it to a very American author. Uh, the story, uh, when you sort of hear what it's about, it sounds like a sort of a, almost a conventional suspense movie possibly. Uh, we have a young man uh, and he runs into a woman who he used to know a long time ago, a young woman uh, and uh, at first he's not sure who she is but then they sort of get together and they start seeing each other and then she says she's going away on a trip for a while out of the country and would he feed her cat while she's gone? So he agrees to do this and he's coming by her apartment. They, they become a couple but then she immediately leaves on this trip uh, and he's coming by the apartment to feed the cat. He never sees the cat. He's not even sure there's a cat there, although apparently the food is disappearing uh, day by day. So it's a little bit mysterious right there. Uh, then she comes back, and she comes back with another man who she's met, uh, and he seems to be a slippery type of a guy. He's kind of charming, he's kind of nice looking, but it's really not clear just who he is or what he does or what his place in the world is. Uh, he just sort of always seems to be around and to be charming and so forth. And anyway, little by little, as this long movie develops, uh, our main character starts to get suspicions about this other character who says that he has a hobby. His hobby is burning down greenhouses. Uh, he will find a greenhouse and he will, in the dark of night, sneak up there and burn it down. A strange hobby to have. And eventually our main character decides that this other fellow uh, is maybe worse than just a, a serial arsonist, that maybe he's actually a serial killer and that maybe something has happened to the woman who they are both involved with. Uh, so again, we have a story that sounds in outline like a sort of a regular suspense movie, but it develops in this very gradual way over this period of two and a half hours. Uh, I never found it involving the way, uh, you know, a movie about growing suspicions about somebody who might be a killer, uh, the way we would normally expect a movie to like that to, 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 to sort of draw us in and develop conventional suspense and so forth. But it's an interesting movie to watch. It's very gradual development. It's 
see the gradual pieces fall into place. And there are certain mysteries about the film which are never really resolved. And I rather like that sort of thing. I like movies that give us a sense of mystery. I also like movies that are cut and dried and tell us what's what. But I like movies that develop a sense of mystery over uh, a considerable period of time. And I found Burning to be a, a very interesting and involving film to watch without actually being, shall we say, fully engrossing. Uh, that said, it's always fine to see uh, a movie from Asia, from South Korea, find a place on theaters, even you know, in, in American theaters, even if, uh, again, it's not playing at every multiplex. And it's a very interesting movie that's well, well worth seeking out by people who want to just have something very different, especially in this post-holiday season that we're in right now, uh, in January, when, uh, as everybody knows, almost all the worthwhile American movies have already come out. Because the idea is you have to open before the end of the year before you can qualify for awards. So most of the American movies that are coming out around now are movies that their own distributors felt had no chance for any awards anywhere. So why not just wait until after the new year and put them into theaters then? So it's sort of a dead time for new uh, domestic product. Uh, but we do have some interesting product coming in from overseas. And speaking of that, I have just got done speaking about an Asian movie that's about two and a half hours long. Well, I will now do do myself one better by talking about an Asian film which is well over eight hours long and yes amazingly has had a certain amount of uh, theatrical exposure in the United States uh, and you know there are other ways to find these things nowadays in our wonderful world of, uh, of, 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 of video uh, and this is a movie called Dead Souls that does not refer to the famous Gogol novel uh, this is a new movie by Wang Bing a Chinese filmmaker and uh, again it is way over eight hours long and it is a documentary, and it is about uh, the so-called re-education camps that were set up by the Chinese Communist government uh, in the late 1950s, off in the Gobi Desert. Uh, and uh, people who were uh, convicted of or even just suspected of thought crimes, which basically sort of meant simply thinking, uh, during the uh, the infamous uh, reign of Mao Zedong, uh, people were often rounded up and sent off to these re-education camps where they would languish for years and very often starve to death or die of illness or some other horrible thing because the conditions in these places were absolutely rotten. So, Wang Bing, the Chinese filmmaker, is looking back at this period uh, and is uh, it's basically a talking head documentary, what we, we really have here. There are other things that come into it. We have people walking around the sites where some of these, uh, a couple of these re-education camps were actually set up, looking for sort of relics, sort of little bits and pieces of evidence that these places were actually there, finding little bits, including shards of bone, for example, uh, that are reminders of the horrors that went on in these locations. But what we mainly have uh, is talking head interviews with these now very, very, very old survivors. Each one's age is given at the beginning of his or her interview. And these are old people. They're like in their 80s and beyond uh, in usually the places where they live now. Uh, and they are recalling what went on there and how they managed to survive and how many others did not manage to survive. Uh, they're almost all men. Again, they're very, very old. Uh, they speak very quietly. They discuss what happened. Uh, and they talk about the absolute horrors that they encountered in these places. And the reasons why they were sent off to these places, and very often it was just frame-ups. Uh, once these re-education camps were set up, uh, the communist regime needed people to put in them. And so they would uh, often just frame people, or they would choose one person who somebody didn't like for some reason as an example, and send them off to one of these places where starvation or other kinds of evil could befall them. Uh, it reminds uh, one of, of, of some other very, very long documentaries. Uh, years ago, the great filmmaker Marcel Ophels made some movies that were well over four hours long, which dealt with the, the Nazi experience, particularly as it resonated in France, uh, the sorrow and the pity, which was about the occupation of France and the collaboration and so forth, the memory of justice, uh, a movie he made about Klaus Barbie, the uh, Nazi uh, evil master person, mastermind. Uh, so those were the famous old uh, Marcel Ophel's documentaries, which were only about half as long as Dead Souls. And then there's also the famous Shoah, the great Claude, Claude Landsman movie, again, about the Holocaust, uh, and that's that runs something like nine hours. So that's even longer than Dead Souls. So there's kind of a tradition of these very long documentaries that really get into some horrific historical
historical subject. Uh, Dead Souls is a movie you have to have a lot of stick to if you're going to stick with it. Again, it's mostly talking heads, and it's about something which is not very immediate to most of us American viewers. That said, I learned a lot from it, and it's really uh, quite an experience to sit through the whole thing uh, and try to have some sense of what, uh, what went on during this particular dark episode, during this particularly dark period of, 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 of modern day 20th century history. Finally, that's a documentary. Now, how about a docudrama, a movie which is based on real life, but which is very much a fictionalized movie on the basis of sex. And this is a movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, just recently, there was, a, I mean, just a very few months ago, uh, there was a very good documentary about her called RBG, which really, you know, gave a good overview of her career and had a lot of material about her. And that was a documentary. And now just a few months later, we have On the Basis of Sex, which is a fiction movie, but it is based very directly on the experiences uh, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And interestingly, uh, the filmmakers, and I will mention right now, uh, the movie was uh, written by Daniel Stiepelman and directed by Mimi Leader. Um, uh, the, they, they, they took the interesting uh, decision uh, to not deal with the mature Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who we're all most familiar with as the currently sitting Supreme Court justice. Uh, this goes back way into her earlier life, and it deals with really the first very major case that she took on uh, and that really kind of established her in her profession. Uh, so we have uh, the, the, her beginning, the, you know, more or less the beginning of the movie. Uh, she's going off to Harvard Law School. Uh, she is one of very, very few women in the Harvard Law School. And she is asked by a dean of the Harvard Law School in sort of a public setting, why are you here when your place could be occupied by a man? It's that sort of thing. Uh, you know, this is a time when women were uh, fight, f f facing even more tremendously uphill battles than they face today. But anyway, there she is at Harvard Law Student, and she is married to her husband, Martin Ginsburg, who is just one year ahead of her uh, in the law school. Eventually, he graduates. He gets a job uh, by a New York firm, and she transfers to Columbia University to finish up her degree. Uh, and then she goes out looking, applies everywhere for a job with a law firm, and she can't get a job because she's a woman. And a lot of the firms even say that to her. One of them says, we have a woman. Why would we want another one? Uh, other ones don't want any women at all. So she takes the second best thing. She takes the leavings. Uh, she takes the booby prize. She takes a job as a law professor at Rutgers University. I am a professor myself, and I'm not too pleased about the idea of if you can't get a real job, you become a professor. But that's sort of what happened with her. Uh, as time goes by, she is teaching her courses, and her husband is developing his career. And then uh, she uh, takes a tax law case. That's her husband's special field, is tax law. And uh, it's a very, very interesting case. And again, all of this really, really happened. And this happened back in 1970. There was a man in Colorado who had to hire home care, a nurse, uh, to help with care for his elderly mother so that he could continue to work and support the two of them. And he tried to deduct this from his taxes, and he was denied the deduction because the IRS code says that you can deduct home care for an aging parent if you are a woman, a widower, a divorced person, uh, a husband whose wife is incapacitated or institutionalized. In this case, we have a bachelor who never got married, and so he was not allowed the tax deduction. And so here we have a man who is being discriminated against on the basis of sex, but Ginsburg, who is already a very active feminist, realizes it's wrong to discriminate on the basis of sex no matter what sex is involved and no matter what is going on here, equal protection should mean equal protection under the law. So she takes the case, and that is what occupies the bulk of the film. It only turns into a courtroom drama near the very end. Uh, most of it is about her trying to, uh, to develop this case, uh, taking different approaches, uh, consulting with different people. She's very much involved with the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, which was a long time uh, part of her career and her life. Uh, and they're helping her. And she also has a sort of a mentor who is an older female lawyer who at first doesn't want to help because the whole thing is hopeless, but eventually does decide to help. And that lawyer, by the way, is played by Kathy Bates, who is such a wonderful actress and a 
it's a very small part, but she is very fine in it. Uh, and eventually we have, and here's a spoiler, but you know, it's history and all that. Uh, and obviously we know it's going to develop this way. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wins the case, not in the Supreme Court, in the 10th Court of Appeals. And then after that, of course, the rest is literally history. And at the very, very end of the film, we have one of those cliched shots of the real Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, climbing up the steps of the Supreme Court uh, in the modern day. So the young Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is the main character of this movie, is very nicely played by Felicity Jones. Army Hammer is just terrific as the husband, Martin Ginsburg. And Sam Waterston is just fine as Erwin Griswold, who is the dean of the Harvard Law School at the beginning of the film. Uh, Justin Theroux is in it. I've already mentioned Kathy Bates. So it's a very, very well acted movie. It is not a very inventive movie. As a movie, it is very conventional. It just sort of goes through the motions. It's a very conventional sort of biopic. That said, it's about a very important subject. It raises a very good feeling that it is possible for there to be progress in areas such as women's equal rights and men's equal rights. And we see how Ruth Bader Ginsburg started on a career that has become an enormously important part of modern day, current day, present day American history. Right now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been out of the court because she has been ailing. And I sure hope that she gets better soon because her presence in our lives and in our nation's life is extraordinarily important. And it's nice to have this movie on the basis of sex to remind us of uh, just how important a figure she is and how hard she had to work to get where she is. So that is my story this week, Joe, and I'm sticking to it. For which we thank you, David Stern. Films in focus, the films Burning, Dead Souls, and On the Basis of Sex. Mm -hmm.